The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Hey, buddy, Chris. Uh, yeah, yeah. I always forget to unmute. It's like the one thing I always forget to do. <laughs> so, uh, how's it going? Good morning. Good, man. How you doing? Good. Just um, actually, uh, you're. The thing you asked me to cover yesterday kind of inspired me to fix up some of my scripts that were not, um, they weren't as good as they could have been, uh, particularly with the rates and uh, looking oh, at sweet. recessions and stuff like that. So, And we talked about global liquidity like a couple months ago, and I promised that I'd kind of build a script to do that. So I did that last night too. So. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm excited to hear what you came up with. Cool. So I'll try and uh, speed uh, power through this. So we had the CPI numbers last week. And it was like kind of a mixed bag. The, the producer price index came up in blue. The CPI bumped up. Uh, and that's basically the inflation of everything combined together. But the core inflation came down. And um, the reason for this is likely because oil prices, energy prices have been higher. And core inflation doesn't include food and energy. So um, the core inflation continues to go down, which is kind of good because it's the more sticky one. Um, but CPI has come up. There's a Fed meeting next week, and the expectation across the board is they're going to hold rates steady. That seems to make sense. Again, I think I see weakness in the market, um, so it would make sense to me that they're going to hold rates steady, try and you know hope for the best for inflation. Um, we also saw the unemployment numbers tick up just a little bit, and that's in a way that's kind of a good thing because that will help to get inflation under control. But in a way, that's kind of a bad thing because unemployment is one of these things that's associated with recession. Um, so as unemployment ticks up, that that um, sort of puts us into recession. So it's um, we'll talk about how they define recession here in a minute. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, we'll cover all the usual stuff first, like the macro. Uh, so the ten year ten year yield here is is looking like it uh, like it wants to move up. Where you know it's kind of hit that hit that resistance there, and then it's hitting that again. So I mean, you you kind of expect like, okay, could it do this? Sure. Um, it could also just kind of decide to break out next week. So. Um, Ten-year yield is looking like it's ready to go, uh, at least to me. And take a look at uh, the dollar index. Uh, dollar index has continued to rise. Um, it's interesting to me that the dollar index has been rising as the stock market has still kind of been like hovering near its all-time highs. Um, so that's kind of a trend that had happened at the beginning of the last bear market, where the dollar index had like made a really big move to the upside, and yet the stock market was making all-time highs. Um, the only thing that's different about that is that we've got the reverse repos um, have been coming down. We've been seeing money leave the reverse repos. Now, what we're going to do actually is combine this information because um, we can also look at other things um, like the Fed balance sheet. So it would be better if we could just combine everything to understand the broad picture of liquidity, which we're going to do. Um, gold hasn't moved much, just kind of flat, just hanging out. Um, to me, this actually looks like strength because the reality is that the dollar has been rising significantly, but gold has been doing a pretty good job of holding its own, um, which is gold multiplied by the dollar index, which we've talked about before. So uh, realistically, I mean, gold has been doing pretty good. And um, this is a rising triangle. Usually you would say these break down, um, but I don't think that's going to be the case. I think it's going to break up. Uh, you could still expect this thing to go into 2024 um, before it breaks to the upside. But, <clears throat> you know, I do think it's it's probably getting closer. Uh, let's see. Okay. Let's, did we cover everything? Hang on a second. Fed meeting. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So what I realized with the, uh, the big overview overview yield chart that I showed you guys, um, was that I was kind of using the wrong indicators. I was using kind of like the pleb us 10 year, um, that you would find on, um, I think it's TVC. It, like, so there's different providers, there are different people that publish uh, numbers and information. And then TradingView just takes that information. Um, you know, they have some kind of API, they pull that data, and then they present it to you in charts. And the problem was I wasn't using the actual um, like Fed numbers. Like, so they call it DGS1. That's the one year yield. Uh, DGS10, that's the 10 year yield. That's what they use on the Federal Reserve website. And so what I realized is that I wasn't actually using that. And because of that, I wasn't really getting the full picture. Uh, we need to zoom out here. There we go. So the full picture goes back to about 1962. Um, I think in reality, the 10 year goes back even further than that. But there's probably something there's probably some special reason why the Fed doesn't report it back any further than this. So 
at any rate, um, the colors of the lines have changed just a little bit. I added a few extra ones. Basically, we're going from the three month, six month, one, two, five, 10, 20, and 30 year um, treasuries. And then obviously the uh, in white here is the overnight lending rate. Uh, and then on bottom, as we have had before, is the, um, the overall inversion. So just to give you an idea of, of what this looks like. Um, oh, that's the wrong one. Do, do. All right, treasury spread. So just to give you an idea of what this looks like, we're basically pulling all of the different um, security timeframes. And then we're there's kind of two lines we're doing here. The longest line in light pink is basically all of the yields that we have, which is uh, the 1, 5, 10, and 20. That's That goes all the way back to 1962. But the Fed started adding new yield products, um, like the 30-year and the, mm, I think the three-month and the six-month came around like 1977, 1981, around that time frame. So what we do is after... After those were added, looks like 1981, they were all added. I kind of like got lazy because some were added in 1977 and then 81. So I just said, okay, screw it. Only do the big calculation from 81. So basically we're taking all the spreads um, and then adding them all together and then and then taking their average. So that, that gives us like the big, big, big picture, picture of what's happening with the yield curve inversion. And um, so the point of this chart that you can see like, okay, on, on the... Um, on the uh, shorter term, you can kind of see the yield spreads all, all in different colors, right? The shorter term are kind of lighter colors, um, and they move up to these darker blues. Uh, and then the red is obviously the uh, the inversion. So what you can see is that um, technically we were actually more inverted, like crazy, crazy inverted um, in the late 70s and early 80s, like right around 1980. Um, so we haven't quite gotten there yet, but what we have is unprecedented, and unprecedented um, for, I guess that would be like 50 years now. So, which is interesting, you know, because people talk about the bond, the bond bull market, the 50 year bond bull market. And obviously how in 1971, it's, you know, fairly closely associated with the severing of the gold standard. So what we're really looking at here, I'm going to, I'm going to um, turn some of these off because this will just get uh, cluttered, way too cluttered. We'll keep the overnight uh, federal funds rate on the board. <sighs> Come on. Okay. And then we're going to turn on U.S. recessions. So. Effectively, we just I just want to show you that U.S. recessions have been associated with yield curve inversions. They follow yield curve inversions going back basically as, as far as we can look just about. Um, I guess recessions go back farther, but um, the, the yield chart doesn't go back farther. OK, so you'll notice that this yield curve inversion that happened in uh, in like 1970 was followed by a recession. Again, yield curve inversion followed by a recession. Same thing here. Actually, two of them. Right. So it went really negative came back, had a recession, came back, uh, inverted again, and then had yet another recession. Um, slightly almost kind of there, but that's so delayed, you might say that's not really correlation. Uh, again here um, in obviously 2000, and then again in 2008. So yeah, these yield curve inversions are like historically bad, bad, bad for, for having recessions. So let's talk about what is a recession. Um, it's not like, so people... The cheeky way to say it or the, the kind of common misconception is that it's two quarters of negative GDP growth. And that's not really what it is. I mean, often that can be the case and often those will overlap, but they look at a lot of different things. Um, they look at the unemployment rate. They look at the like what's actually um, like, uh, I don't know, payrolls. They look across like a, a broad um, sampling and metric of the economy. And it's they, they say like they even admit that they don't have um, a specific way of saying when we're in a recession that they kind of like, <laughs> you'll know it when you see it, I guess. Um, so it's like, OK, maybe you had some negative GDP growth recently, for example, but the unemployment rate was really, really low. So um, that factors into things, um, you know, and stock markets are doing good. I don't think they actually factor the stock markets in. Um, so a recession is really, a, it's a broad sampling of a bunch of different metrics. I don't know, I think like non-farm payrolls and um, stuff like that, um, overall payrolls, um, salary, things like that. So uh, very broad sampling. So um, yeah, I mean, the the video that you showed me, Doug, I mean, he made a compelling case. He's like, listen, historically, this is basically almost always correlated. Um, yield curve inversion has basically almost always been correlated with a recession to follow. And a recession almost always means stock market go down. So, um, you know, he says, if you're going to say that's not the case, then you really need to bring compelling data. So, um, you know, it, it might not be enough just to say, hey, reverse repos, it's different this time. Uh, we can maintain this yield curve inversion. I do think it is a little bit different this time because of the reverse repos. I think that is kind of a big data point. I think it's really important. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's the full picture. And, um, 
you know, it, it does intuitively just in my mind, like what does price have to do? It does seem like this is too far, too fast. Price needs to pull back. It needs to like be healthy and establish a lower range and not just shoot to the upside. Because if it does, like we're looking at inflation again, that's like, that's kind of in my mind, that's a big driver of inflation, people's mad gains on risk assets. So um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's one of the things I wanted to look at. Let's take a look at um, where did I put it? Okay. Yeah. Let, let's take a look at the stock market uh, in terms of recession. We're going to mute the global liquidity for a moment because uh, we're still talking about recession. So this is what the stock market looks like um, for the past, let's just say since um, on the same order of time frame that we were looking at. Maybe we can zoom out one more notch here. There we go. Um, so yeah, you can see that basically, okay, recession, stock market go down, recession starts, stock market down, even, um, even like right here, a little recession, stock market down, stock market down, same thing there, obviously the dot-com bust, which is kind of funny because like the recession apparently only happened for a short time frame, and then everything was good. I don't know, probably them fudging the numbers. They love to do that. Recession, 2008, big recession, long recession, lasted like almost two years. Uh, and then a little itty bitty recession here for the for the word that shall not be mentioned. Um, okay, so that that was like that's one way of looking at it. You can say okay, recession basically typically means that um, the stock. Hello. But there's there's oh. one more. Go ahead, man. Oh, we lost you for a sec. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, recession typically means stock market go down, which is why you know I mean that's and we should we should really try to understand historically when could recessions happen. So the other thing that that um, that we talked about earlier. So you know, guys, I will look at the the reverse repos and we'll look at the Fed balance sheet and um, we'll look at the M two money supply, even though that data is kind of delayed. And the reality is that um, it's better if you can combine all that data into one aggregate picture of liquidity, right? Because what are we looking at when we say, hey, reverse repos are going down, which means money's coming out of the reverse repo market. That means that money's going somewhere. Um, is it? maybe repaying debt is going to the stock market, going to the bond market, going into crypto, <laughs> probably not, but maybe. Um, so, and then, you know, when we're looking at the Fed balance sheet, if they're expanding their balance sheet, that means banks are putting more reserves onto there. The Federal Reserve is printing money. They're buying assets, right? The expansion of the Fed balance sheet in broad measure means that liquidity is being added to the general market, which means that there's extra cash slushing around and that cash is going to go somewhere, which is typically risk assets, especially when everyone knows that um, that liquidity is being added to the market in general. Uh, people go for risk assets because they you know they can take the loans, right? The the money's cheap. So really, what we want to do is combine all that information into really one simple met metric that's easier for our monkey brains to understand and hopefully has some kind of correlation that we can fool ourselves might actually exist um, to give us a better picture of what's happening. So this is what this chart is. We're looking at the S and P five hundred on the candles. In the green, we have actually what we'll do here is we'll just silence the global net liquidity. So in the green, um, this is United States uh, net liquidity, at least how I see it. Um, basically, it just includes the United States balance sheets, uh, the M2SL and the reverse repo. So the M2SL, unfortunately, is a delayed reporting by the United States. Everyone else seems to report it fairly frequently, but the United States is delayed by like it's a month to a month and a half sometimes before we'll get the picture. So like right now, we don't we don't know what the M2SL looks like for September. We probably just got the like August 1st numbers, right? So we're like, we're delayed by like six weeks here already. Um, but okay, I just tell it, just assume, I, I tell the, the chart here to assume that number um, up until the present date, even though we're going to find out that's a different number in the future. But um, you know, for lack of a better way of, of doing this, there's probably some kind of estimate out there. I, I couldn't, I have not been able to find like a Wednesday level on the, on the federal reserve balance sheet or sorry, the, it's called the St. Louis federal reserve. Um, I don't know. They put like all of the statistics out. They publish like all of this data. So, um, Anyways, this is like the net liquidity. And as the net liquidity goes up, you'll kind of notice that it goes up sort of along with the stock market. Um, you'll notice there's kind of a cutoff here. And that's probably when they started reporting the Wednesday level on the Federal Reserve balance sheet. Um, I need to, I can fix that. I can make this go back further. Anyways, you'll notice that that basically as liquidity expands, 
um, it's highly correlated with the stock market. So you'll see that, uh, like, for example, net liquidity sort of leveled off. And what happened? The stock market thought it was going to continue going up. And then it's like, oh, hmm, it's starting to level off. So it kind of like stayed there, hoping, hoping. And then it's like, nope. And then it took a big dump. Uh, also, that was associated with what the Federal Reserve was talking about at the time, um, you know, the tamper tantrum and all that. So anyways, um, you know, the stock market is kind of like very optimistic in general. People just know that the Fed's going to keep the stock market rolling. So eventually, um, you know, we had this, uh, um, you know, the thing that will not shall be not be mentioned uh, in March of 2020. And then liquidity just massively expanded and we had a market expansion that went with it. So right now, what we've actually had for most of this time is the U.S. liquidity has been dropping, um, even after like a rebound had started to be made. But remember, the stock market does tend to be highly optimistic. And in the absence of like a nuclear bomb threat, um, you know, like the the nuclear problem that was the housing mortgages uh, in 2008, like in the absence of some or the dot com bust, in the absence of some major, major problem, it doesn't like to crash 50 percent. You know, it'll crash like 15, 25, maybe 30 percent. But it doesn't like to really just have the bottom fall out because people are quite optimistic and they tend to know that the Fed's got their back in most all cases. So, um you know, the stock market, I think, took this optimistic bounce, maybe a little bit ahead of, ahead of schedule. So this is where we want to look at global liquidity because it helps us to understand the picture. So let's take a look at the at the formula down here just so I can get this right. Um, the global liquidity is taking all of the M2 money supply of the different nations, like of the basically like the top 15 nations that make up 99% of the global economy. Um, and then also the... Um, uh, their balance sheets as well. So we're talking China, USD, Eurozone, Japan, uh, Great British Pound, Korean won, Cana uh, Canada, <laughs> good enough, Hong Kong, Brazil, uh, Taiwan, Australia, Swiss, uh, Sweden, Russia, and Mexico. So um, that's what this is all composed of. And that's what we're looking at here. And you'll notice that interestingly enough, there is a little bit more correlation. I would actually almost posit that the correlation with global uh, liquidity because global liquidity includes the US dollar plus what the rest of the nations are doing. So um, in my mind, the correlation here is actually really, really good. It's it's better than um, it's much better than than just looking at the US alone overall. It, it's still important that we look at the US by itself because right now we can see that the US liquidity is actually rising and that money is going to almost certainly stay in the US. Like it's very likely that money will stay in the US. So this is probably giving a little bit of support to the market right here is that is that the US liquidity is actually kind of going up. Um, but we'll mute that again just for the moment. And you can see that basically, um, yeah, we've got this, we've, we've had the net liquidity going up. It was, you know, again, the stock market sort of optimistically bounced. I think a lot of that was also related to the Federal Reserve. Remember back in September, October, um, you had like the Bank of England kind of did a little bond rescue, kind of like the United States did in March this year. Uh, the Bank of England did that last year. And um, and then one of the Fed presidents was like, yeah, well, maybe we'll think about, you know, we should maybe pause the interest rates. It's, you know, it, uh, we've been rising a lot. Maybe we'll pause. And that bounced the stock market sort of ahead of the global liquidity expansion. So anyways, there is a good correlation here. Global liquidity is going down. That would signal downside pressure for the stock market. Um, so. That's, uh, you know, that's that's really uh, kind of a, in a nutshell, looking at the rates, looking at recessions, looking at global liquidity and how that relates to stock markets. So hopefully that's uh, hopefully that uh, meets your expectations in your Doug. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic, <laughs> man. Fantastic. I may have to rewatch it again. Uh, There's a lot of information. Yeah, we flew through it. I'm trying to keep us, yeah. you know, <laughs> short. Yeah. I appreciate that. I appreciate Body it. report is like uh, drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> as long as i'm like up and chipper you know and i haven't stayed up too late the night before <laughs> so what, right. what's your latest, what's your latest feel on monero uh any 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 changes from last week um no i mean i i i it's hard for like i can't analyze the monero price i think it's probably because i'm i'm, I'm too like emotionally involved with it um mm -hmm. to me i mean there's there's the chance we go like if everyone else goes down monero goes down but at the same time, Monero will go down less. Like it's just holding its own. Like it's holding steady here. Um, I think that this downtrending, this this line right here, this big downtrending line, this is probably a good place to like just imagine if things decide to take their pullback, like we've talked about. That's a line we might tend to follow down for a period of time. I think that um, you know maybe 120, maybe we have to go back to 100. I really hope not, but um, I think like 120, 130 is is kind of a good place, a good a good place to find a floor. Uh, again, let's take a look at the, uh, the wave magic. It takes a second to load. 
Uh, we don't need the purple and red lines. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only problem with this indicator. You have to you have to wait for it. It's doing like, I mean, calculating all these lines. There's something like 500 lines being printed here right now. So it's, you know, it takes a minute for trading view. Um, so right now we're kind of hanging out in this lower standard deviation. Um, it wouldn't surprise me to come down to the to the uh, the moving average bands. Mm -hmm. So that's right around 120. That could happen, you know, at some point here between now and the end of the year. I don't think that's the end of the world. I think it's, again, just Monero establishing a solid support. I'm saying I'm not going to go lower. I'm just hanging out here like... No matter how much selling pressure, how much fake Monero CZ or how much of their mining, <laughs> their covert mining operation that they want to do, uh, you know, they're, they're going to have a hard time um, pressing the price down any further. Uh, someone pointed out to me that uh, this looks a bit like uh, head and shoulders right here. So shoulder uh, mm -hmm. and then head. This is the XMR um, BTC ratio. So this might look like a head and shoulders and... Uh, I know a lot of people kind of laugh at head and shoulders. Okay, you know whatever. Um, it might be, and that would kind of make sense seeing how we have the other uh, the other head and shoulders from the uh, XMR.D. This one is you know a lot. It's a lot bigger. It's still just kind of flat. It's still we're like waiting to break to the upside here. Um, again, breaking to the upside in my mind on XMR.D signals risk off in the market. It signals crypto down and probably most likely stocks down. Although yeah. stocks and crypto haven't been nearly as correlated as of late, so. Quick check on the Bitcoin price. Um, yeah, things went down, took a big dip, and then uh, then they came right back up. So it's almost like there was a little bit of fake out here. But overall, that's still not a whole lot of movement. Um, it's the, yeah, so we're up about 3% from where we left off last week. So it fell about 3% and then bounced about 3%. Uh, so right now, sitting at this kind of like uh, this, this down sloping resistance line that used to be the channel. Uh, if this breaks, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to like I'll be forced to abandon my like if we can like convincingly break this line, um, I might be forced to have to abandon temporarily the down thesis. I think overall the down thesis is still intact. Um, I wouldn't want to be getting long these markets for any length of time. In my mind, this crash could have just as easily bounced up and then continued falling down. So I think there's a lot of danger in these markets. Personally, the risk to reward isn't worth it for me. Um, I feel like you know preserving my capital at the moment is is more important in my mind. Um, but, uh, you know, and again, like, like we've talked about, we've, we've been inverted on the yield curve for so long and we, we could be looking at recession coming up soon and recession means lower markets. Um, the, the unemployment rate is starting to rise, which is a good thing for inflation, but a bad thing for being in a recession. It's also a bad thing for the stock market. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's kind of where I see the markets at. Not too much has changed since last week. Um, stocks have been flat. They kind of, they were, they were up then they came down. Crypto was the opposite. It went down, then it came up. Um, overall things are still fairly flat and, uh, flat, you know, boring, but, uh, yeah, that's, uh, those are my thoughts this week. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. we will, we will keep moving on just cause we're limited today. Appreciate yeah. it, buddy. Stick Thanks, around. Buddy.